philosopher by education. Her aim is, as she says, to draw the outlines of a new philosophy of Armenian history, putting it in the context of the general history of the Near East. Since the 7th century and up until less than 100 years ago, most Armenians lived in or in close proximity to the Islamic world. And it is this perspective that she aims to highlight in her work. Seda was born in Aleppo. She went uh, to the Nushan Palangian Jemaran. Nushan? Uh, okay. You know that I'm not from Aleppo. <laughs> then, then Haigasian College in Beirut. She, she got her master's in philosophy in AUA. In 1991, uh, uh, American University of Beirut, sorry. Uh, in 1991, she got her doctor of science in philosophy in Armenia and Moscow. In philosophy. Zeta has taught in Lebanon a couple of years, for a couple of years in the Lebanese American University and Haigazia University and then for 20 years in the American University of Beirut. She has also taught in this country, in Colombia, in the University of Chicago, and St. Persis Armenian Seminary in Russia. For, for, a couple, uh, for a couple of months, last, from September to January last year, she was invited as a visiting professor at Yerevan State University. She has over 50, I think, papers in Armenian and English, and seven books, three of which are in Armenian, and the rest in, and four in English. And the Armenian ones are, I just saw them, so I think, the Panana Heidegger Sutuna, Echer Aremedian Medazumen, and the third one is about uh, Hovannes Gerzengazi, his sources. So with that, Zeta, yes. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I do appreciate your coming during your weekday and late evenings, so I should make it worth the while. Let's see. Now, on April 22nd, two days before April uh, 24, I was invited, and I was thinking about my lecture at the Eskija Museum. I could not forego the factor of timing, even though it was purely coincidental. But since by circumstances, and probably by nature. I have come to make the most out of the worst. I'm after all Armenian and I'm Lebanese, so I have to make the most out of the worst. I decided it was time to declare my personal motto as a justification to talk about something other than the genocide two days before the genocide. It is even more relevant, my motto, to our theme today, one of the toughest, the most complicated themes about Armenian identity. Now my motto is always to be on top of the Armenian past and not to be buried under it. it this applies to, so well to the Armenian April, as I call it, and in general to the Armenian condition, but in particular to Armenian scholarship. One has to be on top of history, not be buried under history. It is similar to the laws of perspective in oriental painting. Let me explain. It's a very, very intricate analogy. Or by oriental painting, I mean like Chinese, uh, Japanese, I mean all the oriental paintings. I'm sure many of us like that art. Let me explain. Why in Western art, perspective lines meet at, the, at a point on the horizon. As we all know, the lines converge at the point on the horizon. That's away from the viewer. And everything goes smaller, right? In Chinese painting, perspective lines are reversed. They meet at the viewer and open up into the landscape. This is why when we look at most oriental paintings, 
we seem to be standing on a high point and dominating on a vast landscape. It's a totally different way of approaching. In other words, we seem to be on top of the scene because all the lights converge in us. And we're still very much part of the landscape. This is how Oriental painting, this is why the painting is very peculiar. Because we are the point, the viewer is the point at which all things end and from which all things begin. That is, the reference is the viewer. We are the reference. This is how I'm going to start my, my theme today. Oriental painting, however, reflects Oriental logic. We call it holistic logic. Holistic logic means seeing all things in their totality, in their interconnectedness, no contradictions, like the yin and yang, you know, that is the two signs, not in their linear relations, not in causal uh, sequence, but in a totality. They overlook the contradictions because they take all things as one, as black and white, as good and evil and whatever. No matter how vast and complicated any scene is, the viewer still maintains a general view of everything. That he doesn't see things in contradiction because that means focusing on singular things. This means looking at everything in their totality. Like, like, like a friend, suppose we have. We accept the person in both good and evil sides, or, or the good and the white. In other words, a human being is a totality. You cannot single out certain aspects and then you know focus on some. So this is the oriented view. As seeing things, the other thing is seeing things in their relationships, not in isolation, without any judgment. This is how I look at the question of Armenian identity. And all things Armenian too, through a holistic yet critical perspective. Now the question of identity was the problematic, as the French call it, that is the, the issue of my first book, that Ikram was talking about, Armenian painting 11 art in the light of the crisis of identity, 1984. That's half the title, in the light of the crisis of identity. I'm not sure how could Mr. Panosyan, who saw me at Abir bookstore the other day, possibly guess when he suggested the theme of identity as a theme for today. But this is to your credit. I don't know how you got that idea from what I spoke there. It had nothing to do with identity, as you know. In this book, that is my last book on the Armenians in the medieval Islamic world. This is my seventh book. In this first book too, let me go back to this book on painting. In this particular, my first book, the Armenian condition in Lebanon and identity, Armenian identity in Lebanon, were my concern. And I found painting as a shortcut. I'm a painter myself, anyway. I had studied art and I have taught art history until uh, 2005. Now from the vantage point of painting, then in 1980, I started writing the book in 1980, I opened a broad landscape where I placed and evaluated the painters as per their reaction to the crisis of identity in post-genocide wave, 1930 to 1980. In other words, I, didn't think, I couldn't talk about painting irrespective of the conditions in Lebanon. These painters are from Lebanon, and they, they have been reacting to the condition of the, the post-genocide Lebanon. So it, it makes no sense to talk about painting unless and until I put them in their proper context. How they reacted to their crisis of identity. That was the question. An Armenian in Lebanon, how do they, for example, anyone who's from Lebanon would know there is Guf, who, who comes from Trebizond, he was born on a ship, he still remembers the fires. His whole painting is about the fires and the past and everything. Everybody knows Guf. And then there is Guf there, who is so humanizing. And there is Paul Giragosian, there is Asadu, so on and so forth. Each one was different in their own manners of reacting to the crisis of identity. So identity is very much in, at, the, at the basis of my work. Anyway, this was another way of approaching art in a holistic that is this total, total, I mean this total view and context, but critical. I'm not sure if the book is really understood to this day. Readers appreciated the information I gave, but they missed the point. Why would I take painting as a shortcut to understanding Armenian identity? That was one way of doing it. All my books are shortcuts to this whole idea of identity. What does it mean to be an Armenian? 
As of mid-80s, my entire work is an existential <coughs> reaction to the Armenian condition of which identity is the core, the center. The center of our, all things Armenian is the question of Armenian identity, Armenian-ness, <coughs> the good or the or whatever about it. I never directly dealt with this topic until Mr. Panosyan took the initiative to ask me to talk about identity. I must admit, it, it has been 30 years and I never really talked about this subject. Now let me introduce the theme of identity. Not an easy one, but we can follow step <coughs> by step. Now, Armenian identity, in quotation marks, is a seemingly clear concept. Seemingly clear. It is considered to be the cornerstone of national persistence. Why do Armenians persist? Because of their insistence on their identity. It seems to be. My argument is that it is simply a construct it is a created idea, which is relative to different factors and therefore not fixed. It is not a fixed idea. It is not a definable and shared object of knowledge, but an assumption, which is nevertheless necessary. It's an assumption, but it's necessary. What is a necessary assumption? It's a very philosophical phrase. Let me explain. One of the greatest philosophers of all time, Immanuel Kant, in 1724, 1804, he's one of the greatest figures of the European Renaissance, I mean, the awakening, the enlightenment trap. He begins his moral philosophy, he has three books, one about uh, pure reason, about art, and about, uh, of course, morality. Three major critiques, as he put. He begins his moral philosophy by what he defines three Postulates. He was a mathematician, by the way. He was a physicist. He never studied philosophy, but he's one of the greatest philosophers of all time. So he says there are three postulates, there are three assumptions of practical reason, not theoretical reason, practical reason, how to behave with people, but the, that are necessary to build any moral system. Three assumptions. I must say, if I have to talk about morality. Okay. These three postulates, these three assumptions are the existence of God, that God exists, the immortality of the soul, two, three, freedom. None of these are provable, and none of these is clear as objectively existing entities that are shared by all. I can talk about a blue or green chair, but I cannot talk about freedom as if it were before me. No one can prove God's existence, or non-existence for that matter. No one can prove immortality of the soul, the soul or the not you know or the finality of the soul but they're there but he said even though i cannot prove these things exist i must assume them i must postulate them in order to make a moral system we must act as if follow this as if we are free agents as if god exists as if our souls are immortal for that we should be accountable for our actions okay i suggest that the concept of Armenian identity, the seemingly simple concept in quotation marks, Armenian identity, is such a postulate. It's just an assumption. We talk, we argue, we write, as if there is something out there that I can show to everybody called Armenian identity. There is no such thing. The concept is never clearly defined, always invested upon, because it must be assumed or postulated. It is a necessary assumption. I cannot start talking about things I mean if I didn't have this posture, this assumption there as a ground of my discussion. It is no secret that we hardly ever agree about the exact content, requirements, or the criteria of identity. No, no two people agree on that. We know that, don't we? It's no secret. But as Derrida, the French philosopher, says, we keep on using the phrase and we communicate through it Precisely because there is this vagueness about it. Because it's vague, so everybody talks about it. Everyone has their own concept, but still acts as if the concept was something objective, which it is not. It is not out there that I can really define it. Two people don't agree on that anyway. The truth is that most of our abstract concepts are in the same category. Can anyone define for me happiness? Can anyone define piety? Can anyone define any other concept? We cannot. These are vague, abstract concepts. Everyone has their own, uh, I mean, 
image of it. However, if we admit that Armenian identity is an assumption, we must still try to analyze it. At least to clear the ground from false pretensions. We must still work at it, we must still try to understand it. Now, let me, let me propose my pet theory on Armenian identity. I've had it for years, but I never really talked about it. As per the synopsis on the Arpa flyer, avoiding essentialist and traditional approaches, Armenian identity is best analyzed through the triangle of identity, knowledge, and studies. Whether it is a synthesis of these three concepts or there's a controversy when I put these things together. Now, this is a deconstructive approach. I'm deconstructing the concept into its constituent. It's a deconstruct. So I'm not starting from a definition. I, I cannot give a definition. I'm not giving any traditional approach because there isn't any that I would accept. So I'm deconstructing, taking it apart, see how it is made up, what is it made of. So I'm looking at identity through its constitutive elements. What makes identity? I mean, safely talking about it. According to me, identity is taken as three things. One, as self-consciousness, that I'm conscious of my Armenian ethnicity, on the subjective, reflective level. This, I think I'm an Armenian, this is subjective level. I'm reflecting upon myself, I'm saying I'm an Armenian. I'm reflecting upon myself. Secondly, identity is, is also knowledge. Identity as knowledge, that is, I know what I know about being Armenian. This is the objective historical level. What I know about the historical aspect of being an Armenian. Where do I come from? I mean, what, who are the Armenians? What is their history? That's the historical level. And then thirdly, identity as Armenian studies or the theoretical, institutional level. What do the institutions, I'm going to explain this, what do the institutions represent as being Armenian, about Armenian history? This is the other level. So let me take up each angle and level. There are three angles, that is self-consciousness, knowledge, and studies, okay? And let me give you the levels on which each one of these is. Okay, identity as self-consciousness. It is subjective individual psychological level. It is largely part of the individual's reflection upon himself. It has to do with the who or the subject. Who is saying that he's Armenian? Okay? It extends into the unconscious as well. It is chaotic because it's not clear. It is emotional and it is impulsive on this psychological, at this lower level. It extends into the unconscious too. I would not use the Freudian id for this, because you know, according to Freud, there are three parts of the psyche, the id, ego, superego. I'm not going to do that. But it's, it's a very complex, chaotic feeling that I'm on me, and then what? It's just the self-consciousness, nothing more, nothing less. Emotional, subjective, inner, personal, okay? Who, who, me, the subject. Most, if not all, Armenians have this consciousness of their ethnic identity. Even those who say that I don't like being an Armenian, they still know they're an Armenian. It's this consciousness of the self. But while in some it is just a background notion, you know, some people say, you know, my parents were Armenian. I'm supposed to be Armenian. This is the, 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 the least, I mean, the lowest level of this consciousness. In others, being Armenian develops into an existential intellectual crisis. What does it mean to be an Armenian? It is a crisis. If you ask me, being an Armenian or Armenianist is a crisis before anything else. Because always we have had to, uh, we have had hyphenated identities, you know. I'm Lebanese Armenian, hyphenated. I'm American Armenian. I'm, uh, well, even Armenians in Armenia is, is uh, you know, they, they are Armenians of, of the Republic. That's another hyphenation, by the way. And then there's a long story, I will not go into the historical details, the way I see Armenians in their, uh, in their actual, um, experiences all over the world. That's another subject, I will not go into that. Now secondly, identity is knowledge. Now by knowledge I mean the language and history. This is the objective level. That is language and historical knowledge. This is objective. It is not subjective. In other words, the history is there, the language is there. It's not mine, I didn't make them. But collective, this is collective. We all have the same history. We all have the same language. And then it deals with the what or the content of identity. What is in this content? When you say I'm Armenian, history must have a content, okay? It involves the knowledge of language and the historical past. This is absolutely essential. The historical past. Where do you come from? 
On this level, identity is acquired. Somebody taught you. It is rational because you have to understand what, you're what, what we talked about, and it is controlled. Because I cannot create stories about, about our history. It is controlled. It is under historical control. This is probably the most significant level. We must decide if without knowledge about national history, if without knowledge of the language too, if without any objective content, ethnic consciousness is sufficient. If I only feel I'm an Armenian, does that make me Armenian? If there is no content, no knowledge, no language. I mean, I'm just proposing some of the issues involved in this. After years of experience as an academic and part of the intellectual circles, I have come to the conclusion that knowledge of language and history are the core of being Armenian and an Armenologist. I cannot imagine any Armenian studies or a scholar in Armenian studies who doesn't know Armenian. And unfortunately, many Armenian studies scholars today do not know Armenian. This is a huge problem, I mean, in my opinion. For some, it doesn't make much difference. You know, many of them, for example, many Arabs don't even know Arabic. So this is just my opinion, OK? Knowledge is the objective content of national identity. It is the objective content. It's not my feeling about myself. It's an objective content. I should know history. That's objective. Without this content, identity will shrink. It will recede into a chaotic emotional level and will vary according to circumstance individual. Then if, if two people know nothing, then it all depends on how people feel about them. There's no objective content, then there is no identity. It's just a, just a background feeling. <coughs> There is a huge problem here. Only a negligible number of average Armenians have any knowledge of their national history. We know this, don't we? These days, the language has suffered too. What most Armenians know as history is nothing but a quasi or a semi-epic and story transmitted through popular books, in other words, very you know, elementary books, semi-educated elementary school teachers, some papers, the church, the folklore, journalistic rhetoric, some TV programs, that's all. That's all they know. A vague idea about just the genocide and oral history do not constitute knowledge. I mean something much bigger, much more serious. Otherwise, mere consciousness without knowledge as content is insufficient in my opinion. I keep saying this, this is just my opinion. Thirdly, identity is defined on the level of institutions. This is very important. Institutions, the church in particular, but more importantly, Armenian studies and Armenian parties. I, by parties, I mean cultural parties and, of course, political parties. These are the major Armenian institutions. Of course, we have the republic, too. That's another, it's a state. It's a republic. On this level, identity is determined in reference to authority. While in the first one was subjective, now this is authority. In other words, there's an institution that's the authority. The church is authority. Parties are authorities. This is where the how of identity comes, or the laws, as per the dictates, demands, agendas of institutions of the Armenians. All these institutions have dictates. They have demands, they have agendas. They want you to think in certain ways about being an Armenian. On this level, identity is ideological, imposed from outside. It is structural. They want, they want you to be in a certain way an Armenian. And it is academic sometimes, if you belong to a, a, an Armenian studies program, for example. But the most dangerous point is the following. In all cases, when I, when I get these dictates, they are all interpretive. In other words, these are the interpretations of the institutions that impose them. For example, the church has a way of interpreting being an Armenian. A party has its own. These are interpretive. In other words, they are imposed upon you, and they are subjective or related to the institution that's been given to you. There's nothing objective about this. The church has its own definition and criteria. Everybody knows that. So do the institutions of higher learning, centers of Armenian studies. By the way, if you don't know, there are 16 centers of Armenian studies in the US only. 16 centers. I mean, all over the US, not Canada. OK? Scholars, academics, party chiefs, higher clergy, Kodorikoi, they all have their images of being an army and how to be, you know, what are the laws. They are all makers of the images of identity. They create these images which vary and contradict each other too. Not everybody says the same thing, do they? They are contradictory. 
because they depend on the interests of the side that's been proposing these ideas. It is their agendas that have been re reflecting these images. They're not objective images. They're imposed upon you. In all cases, these images are imposed on the Armenians, as I said. On this level, national identity seems to be to be co I mean, to correspond to the Freudian superego. This time, I can use the superego. It is this harsh, uncompromising part of the soul or the psyche. It dictates the laws of the Armenians. It dictates the ethics of being an Armenian. I mean, what makes a good Armenian? The, the, the good about being an Armenian. So they're all dictated. So let me sum up. The three corners of identity are on the three levels. Let's sum up. One, self-consciousness on the subjective reflective level. Okay, this is the one. Secondly, knowledge on the objective historical level. Okay. Third, on the theoretical institutional level. This is the studies part. Now, let, the question is the following. Shall we take the, the formula of synthesis? Is being an army a synthesis of all these three levels, three corners, or there's a controversy there? They just don't work together. Suppose I take these three. One, let's take the synthesis part. If we consider identity a synthesis and a fusion of three manners or the levels of being, we'll have, then we should have a sum total of self-consciousness of ethnic background, secondly, some knowledge of the past, thirdly, connection to some institutions, right? If I take a synthesis, I must be connected to some institutions, I must have some knowledge, I must feel I'm Armenian, you know? If I take this logic of synthesis, identity will be a matter of degree, such that the higher the awareness of national consciousness, the more historic knowledge I have, the closer I'm connected to institutions, the better an Armenian I am. Not true. It sounds like a sort of formula. It sounds like a recipe. The question is, could we adopt the formula of synthesis as a paradigm to define our mean identity? The answer is no. I cannot take the synthesis, the formula of synthesis. Not so simple, absolutely. Because seemingly and superficially acceptable, this model is in fact very problematic. And each one of the three senses of identity is controversial anyway. So let us take the controversial aspects of each level. What is wrong with each level? First, in my but self-consciousness, that is the subjective level. In my opinion, while the emotional, impulsive, and often inherited level of identity, because my father is Armenian, I'm Armenian, that's inherited, even though this is necessary, and probably the most common and available, more or less everybody has this kind of sense, it is passive. This is passive. It is given to me from my parents. It is passive. And can hardly motivate an individual to go beyond emotions into an active and creative process of being an Armenian. Being an Armenian is an active and creative process. You don't become, you're not an Armenian passively. Because my father is Armenian, that doesn't make me Armenian. In other words, yeah, I, I may have a consciousness, but that doesn't qualify me to be an Armenian. Mere consciousness of identity may even prove to be obstructive to more rational and critical attitudes. Let me give an example. When I was a kid, I remember a friend of my father who was hypersensitive about his Armenian background. Then it was the Soviet times. He would not hear any criticism of Soviet Armenian. Nothing, nothing, absolutely. Whenever they could, well, my father happened to be a Tashkent and he was not a Tashkent. Anyway, he wouldn't hear any criticism of Soviet Armenian. No criticism of the church or the Catholics and other national institutions. Otherwise, this man knew no Armenian whatsoever. He spoke Turkish, by the way. He sent his children to French schools, had no connection to any organization, not even the church. He didn't go to church. He knew nothing about history except the name of the town in Silesia from where his parents had come. That's all he knew. Now, how do I evaluate the Armenian identity of this man? On the other hand, there are Armenians who are not emotional at all about their ethnic background. In fact, in many ways, they are cosmopolitan. They seem to be indifferent, but are curious about their history. They speak, may and may not speak Armenian, and are connected, but many often are connected to institutions, to parties, or they go, you know, connected to the culture. Now, how do I evaluate their identity? Is there a common criterion for me to evaluate this person or that person? In other words, consciousness, mere consciousness, doesn't help me understand somebody's identity. It's problematic. 
This is one. It's passive, it's problematic. I can't take it as a criteria. Okay. Secondly, identity as knowledge on the objective historical level. Okay. Next, I'll take this identity as knowledge. I mean, by knowledge, I mean language, culture, history, of course, and definitely the arts. I mean, music and this and that. Okay. Whether this knowledge is the decisive factor is a matter of opinion. But it, it's very hard to argue on the contrary. That's someone who knows the history, is connected to the arts, knows everything. It is hard to say that this man is not a good argument. That's very hard. If he knows the language too and very much connected to the institution. In my view, this is the most active, rational, ordered, and targeted aspect of type. Therefore, the most significant level in the making of a stronger sense for national identity. We simply cannot argue that knowledge is neither essential nor necessary. No one can argue against knowledge being not necessary or you know, insufficient. Indeed, some say that most Armenians are barely aware of their history, but are still good Armenians. This is an observation, it's not an argument. To say that most Armenians don't know Armenian, but they're good Armenians, this is not an argument, it's just an observation. You're not saying, you're not arguing, you're not giving me reasons. What do we mean, by the way, by a good Armenian? Who is a good Armenian? And who is a bad Armenian? Does anybody have any definitions? No. People, everyone has their own understanding. Of so this is why the concept is very vague. Knowledge of one's language and history is such that, this is my, it is my pet theory. Knowledge of one's language and history is such that it metamorphoses in and through the knower into new forms of Armenian-ness and draws its own trajectory into higher and more complex manners of thought and existence in historical context. The more I know, the more I get involved in knowledge, it, the more I, I give myself a chance to, to let this knowledge grow and metamorphose and get complicated, and then it, it has this capacity. If you read one book, one good book about the Armenians, let's say, one good book, it really grows in you, it becomes another book, it becomes many books and you become other people through the book. It really has this capacity, knowledge has this ability to grow in you, to be appropriate. It's not the knowledge of the author anymore, it's my knowledge because I assimilate, I appropriate that knowledge. It has this, 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 uh, how should I, this, this peculiarity. Now here is the significance of knowledge. Thirdly, identity as Armenian studies on the theoretical institutional level. This is the most problematic aspect of national identity because the role and the choice of the individual are minimal and he, she is inevitably exposed to one institutional bias. All institutions are biased, aren't they, about themselves. Secondly, political manipulation, something I totally reject, being manipulated by some political uh, institution and ideological control. No one should allow being controlled by any ideology unless they want to. So contemporary Armenian scholarship, especially in the Republic, and Dikan has been asking about my experience in, in, a, in the State University of Armenia for four months. That was a baptism of fire. <laughs> okay, especially in the Republic, and also outside it too. Never mind, let's not single things out. See, I cannot say that, and outside too is highly politicized. Armenian studies today are politicized, highly politicized, wherever they are found. In the Republic, outside the Republic, Armenian centers in the US, Armenian centers in Europe, tell me about them. They're all politicized. Furthermore, various value systems, value systems that have been inherited from the fifth century, you know, the, the classical age of Armenians, nationalist ideology of the awakening, that is 18th, 19th centuries, this is the age of nationalism. The legacy of 50 years of Ottoman atrocities, that is from 1878 until 1920s, 50 years of, not just one, we talk about the genocide as if it were a one day event, it's 50 years of massacres. We just, you know, we, we haven't even started thinking about them. The legacy, this legacy, and then of course the past 20 years of the Republic, and then how do we understand the situation? So this is it, <coughs> images of national identity, are fabricated, and I'm using this word with intention, are fabricated by academics, people and groups at the head of institutions. Even tourist agencies have their stories about being an army. They teach you how to be an army, what to do, what not to do. Tourist agencies, uh, media men, actors, singers, 
everybody, each their own way, with varying degrees of aggressivity and interest, because people have an interest in, in, in marketing business. It is true that the community is primarily a body politic, as they say, and functions only through institutions and laws. There is no community without those institutions. That wouldn't be a community. But the Armenian condition and the historical development on a vast habitat is such that the various structures and institutions have developed on diverging paths. Everyone has developed differently. The parties, the republic, uh, the, the various communities, it, all the paths are very diverging. And each seems to have generated its own agendas, images, and requirements of identity. What's an identity in the U.S. is not an identity, let's say, in France or wherever. So different requirements for identity. Circulating narratives, art forms, images, concepts uh, uh, through books, lectures, sermons, press, songs, pictures and media contain high doses of Armenian identity, in quotation marks. There is a chaotic market of identity images. This is the problem. It's a chaotic market. Everybody says their own version of identity. It's just a product, basically. As Foucault says, knowledge is power. And since it is always an interpretation by an individual or an institution or a group, it is a production and an instrument with specific objective. People know, when people have knowledge, they may use it for a specific purpose. If I know something you don't know, then that's power in my hand. Knowledge is power, of course. The average Armenian, who has little knowledge of their history and culture, is a consumer. And as such, he is a passive, in a passive position and at a great disadvantage. Whatever they say, I cannot accept, I cannot believe, I cannot buy. But sometimes people have been consuming whatever is being fabricated or, or presented on this market. In my view, one cannot adopt an identity based on knowledge produced by sources outside him. The knowledge you give me is not mine. I cannot adopt that. The Armenian is not what this or that institution sees as an authentic manner of being an Armenian. There is no one-size identity. It doesn't fit everyone. There is no such thing. Identity must be my size. There is no one-size identity. I'm not yet questioning the quality of the knowledge produced, its standards, and the agenda of the producers of so-called national history and culture. Furthermore, it is no secret that what one group sees as authentic or satisfactory identity, another one rejects and instead offers his own. So what should I do? Some of the most common and tedious debates are about language, Eastern, Western Armenian. The dictation, you know, whether this dictation, and then the pronunciation. And then there are uh, discussions totally futile. I've been to dozens of these. Armenian diaspora identities, whether an Armenian, but then again, if one million Armenians are outside Armenia, to, are they diaspora or not? Are we the diaspora? Are they the, what is that? The, the term diaspora makes absolutely no sense because as of the 10th century, that is for 1,000 years, 80% of Armenians have not lived on their mainland. They have lived outside, wherever, but outside definitely, 80%. So, uh, the shortcut and solution is to adopt skeptical and critical attitudes. I mean, you should doubt everything that, are, that you're offered and to look at the entire culture industry. I call this, borrowing a word from Adorno, there is a culture industry. People have been producing culture. There is an industry, and if you look at the media, they're producing culture. This is the culture industry. Today, if you go to Armenia or wherever, the, the culture is being produced as if it were something, uh, it's a technology. They give you whatever they want you to understand. So I should look at it from a holistic vantage point and decide my identity on my own, not imposed on somebody else. If active and personalized identity, my identity, that's my choice, is the core of a free nation's forceful persistence through time, and if it is the essence and meaning of the individual's existence, then it must have historical content of the individual's choice and no one else. If this is the core, the historical content must be my choice, my selection, my, my making, as a structure in my head. This is the principle. Now, the ultimate objective is to create the circumstances to prepare and enable the common Armenian to reach a level 
when he or she will not only want to define the essence of the historicity of his existence, that I'm Armenian, as an army, wherever and however, but also to be able to do so. I should be able to do this. I, I should have the, you know, the, the, the possibilities. This is a systemic issue. It's not an individual issue, mind you. This is not an individual crusade. It is also an individual choice, but it's a systemic issue. The Armenian system must motivate and enable the individual to make the right choices in total freedom of choice and judgment for that matter. The process also includes the means, the mechanisms too, but first and foremost, it requires a total transformation of the cultural politics of Armenian institutions. I repeat, a total transformation of the cultural politics of Armenian institutions. They must change their, uh, their, their, their politics. What is culture? For example, well, we'll talk about it later on. Let me finish. This may sound too idealistic. I mean, talking about transformation of culture is too idealistic, really. But for a project of these dimensions, the first steps must be taken by individuals, us, every one of us, each one of us. I believe in the power of one, but I also believe in one plus one plus one, and that makes us whole. Thank you very much. Time for questions.